Today, I talk with Evan Cole, Director of Customer Engagement for Kaiser Permanente and a founding executive member of Wellness Underground. Evan and her team consult with employers to help them weave wellness into the fabric of their organizations. She has strong feelings about the way wellness is working, or perhaps not working, and is passionate about making people's lives better. Evan has a broad reach and gives a great perspective about the current state of the wellness industry. In this episode, we discuss why employers can't force employees to change their behavior, the ROI conversation, her role in Wellness Underground, what's wrong and right with the wellness industry, and finally, how can we make life easier for employees instead of harder, which she calls wellness by subtraction. If you're joining me for the first time, then welcome. For my regular listeners, you may have noticed that I started publishing two interviews a week. I'll keep that frequency up through August, then more than likely go back to once a week with a quick tip on Friday. I had some interviews that had been sitting for a while and they're piling up and I just wanted to get them out because it's just good content. For more on redesigning wellness and my services, you can visit my website at redesigningwellness.com. And as always, thank you so much for listening and I hope you enjoy this conversation with Evan. Hello and welcome to Redesigning Wellness, your go-to podcast for making the most of your corporate health strategies. Your host is Jen Arnold, Corporate Wellness Consultant. With over a decade of experience in promoting worksite health, she'll help boost your wellness program to one your employees are sure to enjoy. And now, here's Jen. Evan is the Director of Strategic Customer Engagement for Kaiser Permanente, where she leads the workforce health consulting team, as well as strategy and development of employer on-site clinics. She works to facilitate strategic customer solutions for employer groups, partnering closely with the Kaiser Care Delivery Team, health educators, and health coaches to improve the health and well-being of populations and communities. She's also a founding executive member of Wellness Underground, and she helps to oversee aspects of the growing audience, considering ways to be creatively disruptive, organizing workshops, and looking for ways to make a positive influence. So she is out in Portland, Oregon, and loves spending time outdoors with her husband and their two daughters, and couldn't live without her yoga practice, good food, and music. Welcome, Evan. Thanks so much. Glad to be here. That is definitely a lot in that intro right there. And I think for (laughs) us, you know, me prior being in the insurance world, I kind of get what you do. But for the audience here, can you tell us a bit about the work you do as Director of Strategic Customer Engagement? You bet. Um, So I lead a team of consultants. Um, that consult with employers for their worksite wellness programs. Um, and I do that for Kaiser Permanente, which is an integrated care delivery system. So uh, we have both care delivery as well as the health insurance arm uh, within our company. And then what I also get to do in my role is to drive our strategy for on-site clinics at employer sites, um, which is something kind of new for us. And something new for a lot of employers where they're starting to look at how can they provide health care at the work site. Um, and often that crosses over into the world of work site wellness. Right. Well, that's what I do day to day. When you're, you and your team are going out consulting with employer groups, what types of wellness offerings do you see most often? You know, what we see a lot, um, and, you know, I'll back up a little and say that what, what we do is truly consulting. So we're spot partners with employers. We're not selling products. Um, we're really focused on helping them understand their culture, understand the health of their population, give some metrics for them to work with, and then kind of where do they go, help them build a plan and a strategy. So what we do tend to see when we go out is really activity-centered programs, so lots of programs that are centered on um, exercise and nutrition and really trying to get employees to participate in activity-based programs around those things, um, where we're really trying to drive it to be more culture-based and weave it into the fabric of how they do business and, and kind of their corporate identity. Mostly what we see is um, wellness as a, as a program as kind of just an offering that comes and goes. And then how do you get them to get more into the culture and the environment, kind of the bigger picture? Or, I mean, I'm sure in my day, I couldn't always convince every employer. And I always say I'm not in the business of trying to convince every employer if they're not interested. Mm -hmm. So how do you draw Mm -hmm. the line between, you know, the people and the employers who really want to make a change versus those who want to stay in an activity-driven participation model? Mm -hmm. Well, I think for us, 
the key is being able to get to the decision makers. Um, and really have those conversations with the decision makers because if they're not, if their head isn't there, if they're, and their heart isn't there, if they're not ready to really think about how they do business and really fundamentally shifting how they do business and how they engage with their employees, then they're probably not ready to go much beyond that activity centered wellness. And, and the activity centered wellness can be fine for that type of company. It can be great if they just want to do a, a fun, a uh, wellness challenge or a health fair type day where where they have a day where they think about health and wellness, um, that can be appropriate for that kind of company. So we're definitely not, just like with individual behavior change, you can't force anybody to do something they're not ready for. And the same thing goes for, for a corporation. Right. And do you typically see them offering incentives or are those taken out of the equation in, in some of these conversations? Uh, yeah, incentives definitely seem to be kind of standard across most of the companies um, that we work with. Uh, and, and part of our consulting practice is really that, you know, incentives have application for um, even outside of wellness. Anytime you want someone to do a one-time activity, like you want them to complete a health risk assessment or you want them to take a employee survey or go in and do something once, uh, and incentives can bump a certain number of people to actually kind of nudge them into do that activity. But we're definitely always kind of consulting on, you know, if you want to create long-term behavior change, there's a lot more behind that than just providing an incentive. It really has to be something someone wants to do intrinsically, not something you reward them for. And so what are a few things that you would recommend to an employer who's trying to get employees to actually make this behavior change and not so much do a one-time activity? Well, um, you know, again, back to the culture question, uh, what we try to say is, is that, you know, it really is about when someone is ready, making sure that the environment supports any change that they want to make. So it's not that we can force them into changing behavior, but when they're ready to make a change, whatever it is for that individual that's meaningful and resonates, it'll be different for every person, but when they find that moment, their company that they work for should really be there to roll out the red carpet of everything you want and need is right in front of you, remove barriers, make sure there's not a big bowl of candy on the desk right in front of them or donuts in their work meeting on Friday um, if they're trying to make changes about what they eat, um, and really to, to find a way to embrace people in that behavior change and be there for them. Um, but I really don't think, and, and this is hard for employers to, to want to believe sometimes, I really don't think they can force people to change their behavior. Right. And, and I think it feels, because I've been in many conversations with higher ups, and I think just raise the penalty a bit, right? Just, you know, if, mm-hmm. if you just put enough at risk or there's a penalty in place, people are automatically going to go, okay, I'll do it. And in some cases, Absolutely. I think that can work, but then they're just pissed off because of it, right? So you may get yeah. you may get them to do something, but they're not happy about it. And I think it's a little it defeats the goal, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. And even long term, I think that can deter someone from wanting to really make that change because we all have a little bit of that rebellious spirit in us. And when we're told to do something, we might do it for fear of being penalized. Or we might do it because we really want that $100 gift card because we can think exactly what we'd spend it on. But as soon as that penalty or that fear of penalty is removed or as as soon as the the carrot and the the desire to to get the reward is removed, the behavior stops. And so you never allow someone that glorious moment of when it really is an intrinsic motivation and when the reward is how good I feel when I walk every day or the reward is man, my knees don't hurt anymore because I lost 10 pounds. That's the reward. It's not the $100 gift card. And and the penalty isn't, you know, I have to pay $10 more a month on my insurance premium. The penalty is my knees hurt. And so really trying to to have it be intrinsic that way, letting people get there on their own. Um, And and that's hard for employers because they, most of them really do care and they really want to create a healthier population and they want to improve people's lives. But they also kind of go about it um, in a way that I wouldn't recommend. Yeah, and I think sometimes it's it's held to the the benefits, right? So they see the increasing healthcare mm-hmm. costs, and the benefits are just out mm-hmm. of control, and it feels like it's like a knee jerk reaction. They got to do something, and I've got to do something that feels like it's going to be um, not not instant, but just something that feels like it's actionable um, instead of mm-hmm. the slow behavior change that we know how long it takes someone to change their behavior sometimes. 
It does. And it, I think it's harder and harder in this, um, you know, time, this era when employees aren't necessarily staying with one company as long. And so it can feel frustrating for an employer when this is such a slow process and they're chipping, chipping, chipping away at it over time. Maybe it takes five, seven years for someone to really change their behavior and to sustain it. Well, that person may not work for my company anymore by the time they've really made that change. And so I don't necessarily reap the benefit of them not being on their blood pressure medicine anymore or their weight loss. But if we can collectively do it as a society and a community, we're all going to benefit because my employee will become your employee and your employee will become mine. So, so I try to kind of speak about it that way with employers, that it's a bigger cultural and community-wide investment, not mm-hmm. just about my employees and what my, my uh, renewal on my insurance premium is going to look like for next year. Yeah, and I'd also say that some of the employees who make big lifestyle changes, because I think we've all seen them within our organizations, mm-hmm. like when they get to another employer, they're like, wow, you mm-hmm. know, my last employer did a lot for me wellness-wise, and that's almost the bar to them. So they're going out to their future employer going, well, here's what I'm used to. Do you now have these type of offerings? So I think it's it's a really good brand, you know, a way to make your, your brand name with, uh, being an employer. So, yeah, I don't know. It's just the right thing to do. And I know it's, you know, it's easy for us to say it's the right thing to do, but um, it feels like if we could turn the conversation more to that, it is the right thing to do to take care of your employees. And then, as you said, the collective community, um, Mm -hmm. the better we'll be overall. Yeah, and our our employers, as you know, you know, when we go out and talk to people, they're often looking for ROI. And, you know, what's the ROI? And and usually that's thought about in terms of dollars. What am I going to save in the next couple years or in, in the immediate future. Um, and something I often, you know, I kind of will make a, a connection with things like, um, is there an ROI for painting and repairing the bathrooms at your work site? Maybe, but it's not really easy to measure. But you do it because it's the right thing to do. You know it makes people feel better at work if they go into the bathroom and it's <laughs> like it's 1971, right? <laughs> There's not so, water dripping from the ceiling. It's always a good thing. Yeah, exactly. It's the right thing to do. It makes people feel better at work. It makes them, And it makes you an employer of choice. It's easier to recruit and retain employees if your facilities are nice. So, so I try to tie it back like that, that you know, nobody needs to figure out what the ROI is on doing that. It's just it's part of how we do business. We just do it because it's intuitive. And that's where I'd love to see wellness go and, and become part of just how we do business uh, in the corporate culture we live in. And, and I don't think we're there yet, but um, we can keep pushing that conversation for sure. Do, do employers ask you that question of you and about your team? ROI? About ROI. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, that That is typically kind of the first question we get. And it's often kind of the um, the... It's the way that we we get in the door often is, you know, hey, we're spending a lot on health care. Uh, we're spending a lot on disability. We have high turnover. You know, whatever these kind of questions are, usually it's more about their health care costs. And we are often their health care provider and insurer. And so we're kind of brought to the table to say, hey, Kaiser, how can you help us save money? Um, how can we pay you less next year? Um, and, and that's a tough question because uh, it is – there's so much more to it than, uh, you know, if you get for, for six months of the year people to exercise a little more. That's not going to really shift your, your long-term costs. Um, but it's certainly one of the first questions that's asked. And so so our job is often to answer their question with more questions. So what would it feel like if your employees felt better and wanted to enjoy work and wanted to be at work and felt connected and felt supported and try to kind of ask them more questions about that soft ROI to try to get them to think about it differently. Uh, and, and it's a long convert, you know, it's, it's a conversation that goes on for a while and, and it's not easy to shift someone's perspective, particularly if it's a CFO or someone who's really responsible to, to look at ways to make a more efficient and more productive business. Um, it's, it's an ongoing conversation. So we feel grateful when we're able to be at that table with, with the leaders and decision makers uh, to just be a thought partner and ask a lot of questions and influence their thinking, uh, particularly around ROI. Right. So are you guys the main ones having those conversations with them, or are there other people within Kaiser 
um, having the conversations around ROI and wellness. And I'll, I'll tell you where this question is coming from because mm-hmm. me and my team prior would be the, the wellness experts going out to talk to employers, but there was a whole account management team who were account managers, not so much wellness people that would sometimes sell that wellness had an ROI. And so are you all, I guess, if you want to say this, are you all on the same page with ROI and wellness or do you feel like there's still some education that you need to do on that? No, I think you bring up a really sensitive topic in our industry um, because the way that we've been able to and the way that a lot of people who are selling wellness products and wellness services have been able to get in the door is by making claims about ROI. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that often is what starts the conversation. I feel really fortunate that we have a really close relationship, uh, with our account managers at Kaiser. And it's taken years to get there. We've had this pro- workforce health consulting program in place for about seven or eight years now. But now we have a really kind of, um, close relationship and a partner relationship with our account managers where we've been able to kind of bring them up to speed with, what's really going on in, in the industry and about, you know, the conversation I was just speaking about, about giving value and adding value to our employers, not necessarily making broad sweeping claims about true, you know, ROI or co- cutting costs. Um, and I think uh, we're in a really good place now where, where we're, they, we do have those account managers, but they're really an extension of our team and vice versa. Um, so that's, that's working really well. Where we sometimes have a harder time is, in um, having those conversations with brokers. We're not, you know, we're, we're developing those relationships with the insurance brokers in our region so that, uh, you know, they don't inadvertently, you know, make those kind of claims about what we can do with ROI and then set us and them up not to, to be positioned well with, with an employer. So, so it's lots of, lots of um, education and partnership, and, and we're getting there. Yeah, and I think that's another kind of sensitive topic is mm-hmm. the, the role of the insurance agency and the role of the insurance broker. And Absolutely. It, it definitely, if it's not a collaborative partnership, then it, it is really tough to have a joint message to the client. And I, and I find that, and I mentioned this on a previous podcast, just about the Wellness Underground, that typically the wellness person at a broker agency and the, the wellness person at an insurance agency, you know them, you try to keep them updated as much as possible. But from mm-hmm. the insurance angle, we may not be in front of the client. They may be the ones in front of the client. So you can't always control the messages that they're getting. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think if we could all just get together and say, what is our collective message around wellness? That would be much easier, but that's, you know, in a nice, uh, perfect world. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, and and it is sensitive enough that that's why the Wellness Underground started as it did, kind of as this um, very anonymous group of people. You know, we I think it was a year before I came out as one of the executive <laughs> members of the Wellness Underground, and it's for this very reason. You know, I work for uh, an, um, an integrated care delivery system that is an insurance carrier and kind of lives in that world and works with brokers and in kind of this very public place. And so um, I want to be really considerate that, you know, I really do think we all, if we were to all sit down around the table, everyone has the same desired end goal. We all want healthier populations. We all want to improve the health of people and the quality of life. We all want to save money, of course, you know. So we have these same goals, but it's how we get there uh, that, that sometimes is different or the path there. So, um, So I really don't think there's anyone who's, bad or wrong in this business. We just come at it from different ways. And so um, so it took some courage to, to eventually say, yes, I am part of the Wellness Underground that is questioning the way we're doing this today or the way we have been doing this. And, um, and trying to make it really constructive was our goal rather than just breaking down the system. We wanted to build it back up as well. Right. And you said it took a, a, about a year for you to come out as, you know, hey, yeah. <laughs> I am the, uh, what, what do you, what do you call yourself? The co-facilitator, a founding executive member. I know we call you that. Yeah. But, okay. <laughs> Whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, not that formal, really. I, yeah. I mean, you guys have your stuff together, but no, I would not say it seems formal. Um, it does not seem formal. So tell us how Wellness Underground got started. We heard a little bit uh, from Brian Passan, and as he was actually my first interview, so it's episode two and three. But tell us your perspective on how it got started. Well, there were um, 
three of us that had worked together kind of just a little bit on some similar clients and employers and knew each other a little bit and so decided we'd get together for coffee in that very kind of networking professional way that we all kind of dread and say, okay, we're going to go have this like, kind of networking meeting. And I didn't know these people very well. And I'm actually an introvert. So here I am going out to coffee with people I don't know and um, thought we'd, you know, I'll talk about wellness and where the industry is. And it became clear pretty quickly that the three of us were all a little disillusioned with the current state of wellness with just activities and rewards and penalties and we didn't feel like, you know, we've been doing it for a while and we weren't getting anywhere. And, and it was, it was kind of fun to see us start to get a little braver and say a little bit more about our frustrations over the course of that first coffee date, certainly over the second one. And, um, and I think by the end of the second coffee date, I had said something like, you know, that's it. I'm done with wellness. I'm just going to get my guitar and go sit on a corner with my guitar case open and make money that way because I'll make more of a difference in the world than doing that. <laughs> wow. And, um, Wait, are you, a good, are, you a, point. are you a good guitar player? No, I'm a horrible guitar player, but I'd probably make more money. <laughs> just checking. I didn't know if you were. People. I didn't know if you were like a super awesome guitar player. Just checking. No, no, not at all. Um, but you know, I think Brian at that point started referring to us as the Wellness Underground because it was like, oh, this is this top secret meeting of people who are kind of dissing on the industry that we're in. Um, but then we realized, you know, it was worth our time to get together and talk about this. Um, if we were, you know, really bold enough to start speaking our truth to each other, could we start broadening this out? Could, are there others? There must be other people who feel like us if we're feeling this frustrated and we're in the middle of this industry. And so we just kind of anonymously started putting things out there. Brian and I did a couple ebooks and we started just kind of like putting little fun things out there, blog posts. And people were responding. And it was like this kind of tide of people who were saying, amen, I feel the same way. And so that's really how it started. We started realizing that it was more than just three people in a coffee shop who were disillusioned. It was really kind of where a lot of people in the industry are at. And that's when we started getting uh, a little bolder with it and uh, let our names out more publicly. Brian and I did anyway. And there's still some members of Wellness Underground who who want to remain anonymous because... um, the very sensitivity of the conversations we're talking about, they don't want that to reflect poorly on them because we mostly all have day jobs. So, right. um, yeah, it was an interesting journey, and it, and it continues to be. So were you ever nervous about being at Kaiser in a leadership position, coming out <laughs> coming out with your, <laughs> your true yeah. thoughts about worksite wellness? Because I think sometimes in corporate America, you know, being a professional, we don't always say everything we think, right? We keep some of it inside for sake of professionalism. <laughs> uh, not sure that's always a good thing, obviously. But um, were you nervous about, you know, you, you working at Kaiser and speaking your thoughts? I was. I actually really was. Um and and turned out that was fairly misguided. Uh, as soon as I, you know, I went to my boss. At the time, I was a consultant. I wasn't in a leadership role. I was a consultant working with employers. And I went to my boss and I said, you know, I want you to know I'm part of this wellness underground thing. I'm going to send you some information about what we're talking about. Sometimes we poke fun at carriers. I know that Kaiser Permanente is a carrier. Sometimes we poke fun at brokers. I know that we work with brokers. Um, but I think what really helped was the focus on being um, constructively disruptive, not just disruptive, Mm -hmm. Uh, that there was enough fun to it and enough kind of constructive positivity to it. And when my boss went out and looked at the Wellness Underground website and read the blog and looked at the e-books, she thought it was great and it was exactly what the industry needed. Um, And so I just, yeah, I was really lucky that I was really supported in that. And so that just really continued. Yeah, that, that's great. And I definitely appreciate you guys coming out with us and these other secret members. You know, I'm dying to know who it is, but we'll keep them secret. Um, so how did you even get into the worksite wellness industry? And I know that you've got a master's in public health administration and policy. So how did you get to where you are today? Uh, it was kind of a long winding path, actually. Um, I uh, went into, right out of my MPH, I went into a fellowship at the VA, actually, in um, clinic management, managing mental health clinics um, for the VA for a couple years. Um, and that wasn't quite it for me. That was a little bit, uh, you know, challenging in some ways and, um, you know, was really feeling kind of exhausted at the end of the day. Uh, and And so I 
promptly became a waitress um, and did that for <laughs> about a year and then realized, well, that's actually pretty exhausting, not as glamorous as it felt like it was going to be. So, well, Wait, wait, wait a minute. Of, well, when did you think yeah. being a waitress was glamorous? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> a lot of hard um, work. Yeah, well, and I live in Portland, Oregon, which is a community that really glorifies food and alcohol and the restaurant culture, so maybe that's why I thought it was glamorous, but... Um, no, I went back and then taught at a community college. I went and taught in a program for medical assistance. Um, I taught medical law and ethics and uh, some really interesting classes and kind of thinking about healthcare and trying to think about healthcare differently. Um, I knew that wasn't quite it and then had a baby. And I was actually a stay-at-home mom for about two and a half years. And uh, when the time came to go back to work, um, I really didn't know what I wanted to do except for that I had been a Kaiser Permanente member and it was one of the coolest experiences I had had. It was just a great experience and I thought, well, I'm, I want to work for that company. So I actually came into Kaiser Permanente as an IT project manager. Mm-hmm. Um, talk about a winding path. <laughs> right. yeah. and, and I did that for about three years and actually someone reached out to me who was on the worksite wellness team here at Kaiser and said, I can tell you're really interested in wellness because I would talk about it. I would be out walking on my lunch. I would kind of be evangelizing the benefits. It feels so good to take care of yourself. And um, and so I kind of got recruited into it. And, and it was a field I didn't know much about at all. And um, that was about five years ago. And it's just uh, very um, amazing how life can take you in places you never expected to be. Mm-hmm. And it felt like I found... I found my home. I feel like wellness is the place where the heart and head of, of public health meet, um, where, you know, the population health piece meets, um, you know, professional development and emotional well-being and all these pieces that I always kind of kept were important to me as part of my personal life. And it was this magic moment when kind of my professional life and my personal life merged into something I felt really passionate about for the first time. So, um, yeah, that was about five years ago, and I haven't looked back. Yeah, and I think if you're not passionate about wellness and generally helping people get healthier and just getting really energized when you can help someone make a change, it's mm-hmm. a hard profession to be in, right? Because there's enough people who don't yeah. change that can kind of it make you feel like you're beating your head against the wall, but the ones that do, it mm-hmm. is so rewarding. So it sounds like you've, you've got the passion behind it, definitely. Yeah, and I always say, you know, when I talk to interns or people who are graduating and or have interest or are curious about worksite wellness, I, I always tell them, you know, it's it's hard work. It's not for wimps because it is that it's like that chipping away at something and not seeing the immediate results. But um, what I've really found is if if you're willing to speak your truth and to be really authentic and courageous and kind of bring your your experience, because we, we all work, we all have real experience to draw on from being employees. So if we can think about our own experience and then bring that to the work we do and be really courageous to say the hard things, I think I think we are going to make changes. And I think there's kind of this critical mass right now um, of, of the culture of wellness itself as an industry really shifting. Yeah, and I used to have folks on my team that were not wellness experts and they either were working on a change or they had, you know, made a successful health change. And I think sometimes that could almost go over better with an employer who is maybe struggling with some of the the same things. You know, they're going, hey, look, it's hard. I know I'm trying to get my exercise in. Just like, you know, I'm telling your employees to, you know, to exercise. And um, I'm totally going on a random tangent, but it it had something to do Mm -hmm. with what you're talking about. (laughs) But just thinking about, like, uh, having those champions that that can tell their stories and that can really help inspire others to make a change. Right. Yeah. Cause some of them felt a little insecure that they didn't have this big wellness background, but mm-hmm. I mean, they didn't have to because as humans, if you're trying to make healthy changes, I think that is very relatable and that's very authentic to go in there and go, Hey, look, I'm not perfect. And here's what I'm trying to do. And I understand how hard it can be for your employees. Cause I think, Sometimes when wellness professionals who are super fit, they eat really well, they're just you know, really in good shape, they have a tendency to not understand that some people have a hard time making those yeah. behavior changes and they're not always the most empathetic. They're like, just do it. I do it. it should, yeah. you know, it's easy for me. It should be easy for you. And uh, it's, just, it's just not easy overall. Yeah, and it's not, you know, what I think people often think wellness is about um, 
um, self-efficacy and just kind of this, you know, if you just put your mind to it and it's willpower. And, and I, I think that has very little to do with that, actually. I think it's more about how you were raised and what you were shown as a model for, you know, what what is a typical healthy meal or, you know, how active people around you are. It's social support. It's your community. It's the place you work and what they show is kind of acceptable. Uh, it's government, it's schools, it's communities. So, so you know, we're one piece of it when we do worksite wellness, but, um, you know, healthy behavior is is influenced by so many different parts of our life. And so it's easy for me, you know, someone who grew up with really healthy parents and a really healthy community and was always active, um, but it's really different for people who have not had those same privileges and that same ability to to have those choices be easy for them. So, um, so yeah, that sensitivity is really important in, in what we do. Well, on the flip side, I grew up with a very unhealthy family. So my mom was, mm. she's still, she's still around. Thank God. Um, has diabetes. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't listen to this, so I can just talk about them. <laughs> they don't care. <laughs> um, my mom grew up very unhealthy with some eating issues. And, um, yeah. I think seeing the, I mean, she had some really good quality. She would eat really good food, but then it would be counteracted with eating a lot of food just so, I got used to a very unhealthy food environment, but I always was into health for some reason. Don't know when or why it started. I don't know if I was playing soccer and <laughs> in school, but it started and I definitely, um, I, I don't know, I got started into the health profession. I think that almost led me to the health profession, but yeah, I, you know, work with people all the time that that's not their norm, right? Not having, um, fresh fruits and vegetables and not growing up with exercise being a part of their life. Um, it, it is harder to to just find your way into it in adulthood, right? I mean, you just, it's hard to change as adults. And it is really hard for us to often, you know, in the field of worksite wellness, we get to touch the employee, but it's harder to get to the spouses, the dependents, the family, the people that they, you know, are around the other part of the day when they're not at work. And, you know, it's really easy to make, you know, healthy choices is that if everyone around you is doing the same thing, but then you go home and someone's smoking or you go home and, you know, the expectation is a certain type of food and then it's really hard to do that alone and in a vacuum and, um, you know, I definitely feel like we could do a lot more to reach beyond the walls of of the workplace and, and to make that a broader community effort. Yeah, and, and I, I would definitely encourage employers not to make the spouse do a health assessment or biometric screening because that's not helping anything. Yeah. Um, I think that's, no. that's the normal, I mean, I, mean, I think where employers struggle is that, you want to get to the dependents, I and mean, when you look at healthcare costs, dependents drive a good bit of healthcare costs, right? So you're going, what mm-hmm. can we do to get them involved? They're not on site, and the easy answer is, let's make them do a health assessment, just to make them do something. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. I understand why people do it. I just don't think it's the answer. So at least if you're going to have some kind of you know health and wellness challenge, a fun challenge, include the spouses in some fun way and not in a, a dreadful way. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And and getting kids involved, getting families involved, you know, that's where I think we have to reach beyond employers and start talking to schools and, and you know, making connections there and, and bringing employers together to share what they've learned with other employers and, and making it more community-wide. Um, we're trying to do more of that. Um, in the In the last year or so, we've been trying to pull together small collectives of employers in our communities and in geographic areas to come together and just talk about their challenges in this area and to share what they're working on and and just to try to inspire each other a little bit because just like with individual behavior change, corporate behavior change requires hard work and and trial and error and support and and seeing that other companies can do it, so, so can we, just like individuals need to see that. Yeah, absolutely. So when you, when you think of the wellness industry as a whole, what would you say mm-hmm. is like the, what's wrong with it? If there could be one thing that was wrong with the wellness industry today, what would, what would it be? That is a very big question. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I like to really zing you here. <laughs> this was the formation of the wellness underground was answering that question. Um, <laughs> no, I think, I think for me, if I had to really point to one thing, it is um, thinking of wellness as a commodity that we can sell. Um, that's really where the industry, I think, has been for some time. Um, you know, making promises with easy solutions that, you know, just buy this comprehensive wellness 
program from my company and we will fix all your problems. And, and to me, that is um, endemic still in, in the industry. And um, I think we as wellness professionals need to demand that that ends and demand more um, from the industry because that's really uh, not doing anyone any favors in the industry or the employers. You know, they're spending a lot of money on a product when when what really needs to happen is um, they need to, to think about how they're doing business and what kind of company they are. Not There's nothing they can buy. It's just like an individual wanting to take a pill to make them healthy. It doesn't work that way. Um, so, so I think that would be, it's the commodi- commoditizing, commoditizing, I don't know, <laughs> of, <laughs> of wellness. Yeah, it's not a product you can sell. I mean, I used to always get asked for turnkey solutions and something that I can just mm-hmm. put into my organization and go. And that's, that's not going to help anything. I mean, we could go do that, yeah. but um, it's more of the hard work um, that comes from figuring out who you are as a company, changing the culture, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, yeah. so what, what's going right with it? Where do you feel? Like, do you feel like there's certain aspects of it that are in a good place? I do. Um, you know, I think there is less focus. I'm starting to see um, less focus on... Um, individual behavior and more focus on culture. I'm hearing that at least more in the conversation. Um, I think there's a critical mass kind of at, the, at least, um, and maybe I'm, I'm, you know, seeing things through rose-colored glasses because I get to hang out with the Wellness Underground people, but, um, you know, I do see this kind of paradigm shift or cultural shift in the way we're thinking about things. Um, and it's a, it's a kinder, gentler version of worksite wellness than it was 10 years ago. It's thinking about social support and emotional well-being and the importance of having connections at work and feeling supported by your employer and that you have the ability to make decisions that impact your work. And it's, it's broadening the scope of what we think of as worksite wellness. And, and that's really encouraging. Um, it's also scary because it can just you know, the ripple effect can go out and out and get bigger and bigger in terms of what what's in scope for wellness. Um, I had an experience recently where I was having trouble falling asleep and I was laying in bed and I was kind of trying to define in my head, you know, what is wellness? What is worksite wellness? <laughs> and it, it just kept like, it was like fractals. It just kept getting bigger, going out in these repeating patterns until the last thought I remember having before I fell asleep was, Wellness is everything. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not laughing at your insomnia, but I'm just thinking, I'm just picturing you going, what is wellness? <laughs> These are the deep spiritual questions I ask myself <laughs> trying to fall asleep. But it is, I mean, you know, I can't make behavior change work for me. You know, if, if I'm not doing well, in other words, you know, if, if my home life is not working out, if I feel miserably under the thumb of my boss and I feel threatened about I'm not sure if I'm going to have a job next week because there are layoffs happening. How am I going to, you know, get up the will to go take a 45 minute walk at lunch when I'm not even sure that, you know, I feel safe. And, and so that's where I start thinking wellness is so big. Um, but I, I think people are starting to think about it in a broader sense and make the connections rather than being, insular in our uh, profession and, and just thinking about it from our lens, we're starting to consult with psychology and sociology and learning and organizational development folks and, and really, you know, marketing folks and looking outside of our industry. And, and I think it needs that the picture needs to get bigger for it to be successful. Yeah, we have to really learn from people outside of our profession. I mean, we mm-hmm. see things in a very singular way, and everyone see those, sees you know, everything in their own viewpoint. But I think we could use a little marketing. So I think if you are a wellness slash public health slash health behavior person, then you tend to stay away from, well, we don't want to oversell it. We don't want to market it too much. When really, mm-hmm. we, we do need to market it in the way that it's a good experience for the employee and they actually want to do it. Instead, we tend to rattle off everything they have to do or, you know, actually what it is instead of how they're going to benefit. So we, we definitely have to learn from people from outside of our profession. 
And I think we need to learn from, you know, the, the companies that are sabotaging the very things we're trying to do. So, you know, let's learn from McDonald's. They don't tell you what a French fry is. They put it on a billboard and make it look so delicious that you want, you know, they're, they're unabashed in their, um, you know, promotion of their products and their promotion of why you want this. And we should do the same thing. We don't need to, to try to, you know, educate people about the benefits of quitting smoking. They know. Uh, we need to help them have that understanding of that great feeling they'll have when they can hike a mountain and their lungs don't burn. Um, you know, it's, it's that kind of how will it feel to have this. And that's what, you know, the Coca-Colas and the McDonald's of the world are really good at. Yeah, and I guess with smoking, this is a, a tangent, I have always said with smoking that I feel like if people are going to smoke, they're going to smoke. I am not a non-smoker. I'm going to convince somebody not to smoke. I feel like the people who quit smoking have this moment. I don't know what a moment it is, and I encourage employers to create moments like this to where they're going, hey, I don't want to smoke anymore, and they make up their mm-hmm. mind. But me as a health and wellness professional going, hey, you really shouldn't smoke, that's not going to help them at all. I don't yeah. Smoking is just one of those really hard habits to, to change. It is, and, and I actually think we should focus our efforts as a, as a culture and a community on preventing people from smoking in the first place rather than getting people to quit smoking. I think people are going to make that choice to quit smoking to your point when they're ready, and that's when, back to my earlier analogy, we should be there to roll out the red carpet. When someone has that moment of, I don't want to smoke anymore, we should put all the supports in place. We should have a patch for ready to slap on their arm or, you know, a buddy who just quit smoking too, who's ready to, you know, walk this difficult path with them. Um, but we, you know, we can focus probably a lot more effort on um, getting cigarettes out of the hands of, of little ones. Um, and, you know, I know the first time I ever took a drag on a cigarette, I was a senior in high school. It's like, how do we... And I know people start younger than that. It's like, how do we, how do we help prevent that? Um, that's the bigger question. Right. When, whenever you were at Wellness Underground, one of the things I loved about what you all did this past year, I, it wasn't the first one, but you had the peer presentation. So, you know, people in the audience mm-hmm. would get up and do six minutes, which is awesome. We should have all presentations that way. So. <laughs> <laughs> all <laughs> meetings, I think, should be six minutes. <laughs> yes. Standing meetings or plank meetings or whatever it needs to do, make them go fast. Um, right. One of the things that really resonated with me about your presentation was just all the stuff an employee has going on during a typical work day. It was just impactful. Can you mm. just walk us through that slide? Sure, you bet. And, you know, I, I draw a lot on my own personal experience as a busy professional and parent. Um, but, you know, I did a little research going into this and discovered that um, the average uh, American adult uh, has a 9.7 hour workday and, and during that workday they feel they're able to accomplish 50 to 80 percent of the work they're expected to complete. So they walk away every 10 hour workday feeling like they've failed. They typically take about a 10 minute lunch break. They, mo- the average American has a 45 minute commute, 2.1 children who have school conferences and carpools and after school activities and homework. They get about 27 minutes on average to prepare dinner for their family, Uh, 0.2 business hours in the week that are available for banking or car repairs or appointments, anything, you know, outside of those business hours, uh, it's not going to happen. And uh, about 45 minutes per week of active time. Uh, So that's that's not a great picture. Um, And when, you know, I think... My point was about, you know, wellness what, with this activity-based wellness, really asking people to add more to their lives. Okay, now that you're, you're, that's your life, that's your typical day, and now we want you to spend 10 minutes tracking what you ate and tracking how many steps you took and, oh, yeah, take this health risk assessment and go in. And, and so, I, you know, I would really propose that we need, instead of adding more things to people's lives, uh, we need to subtract. And so, you know, it's wellness by subtraction that, that how can we, in corporate culture, um, make life easier, not harder? Um, it's a big question, but I, I think we can start looking, you know, a little further upstream to some of these, what a typical day looks like and, and how can we break some of that down? 
Yes, I really like that because I think we do ask employees to do way too much um, when it comes to wellness. And so don't want to get too much into on-site clinics, but I want to kind of pick your brain on this. Is that one huh. of the, the reasons that more employers are adding on-site clinics just to make it easier for employees to actually get the care that they need and they don't actually have to go off-site? You know, I really wish that was one of the reasons. Uh, really the, the main reason that employers approach us and probably other, uh, you know, vendors and, and care delivery entities to do an on-site clinic is because there have been great promises of ROI made um, out in the world, much like where wellness has been. Um, there, This is kind of the new shiny object out there. Uh, and, and, again, I can kind of, you know, get myself in trouble talking about this stuff given, you know, where I work. But, um it's not it's not going to save healthcare costs for most companies um but that's what the pro- promises have been made by a lot of vendors who just do this uh that they you know they're all they do for a living is provide these on-site clinics of course they're going to promote it that way um but we haven't really been able to see quantifiable results to show uh that for all companies it's going to going to bring healthcare costs down but one of the nice side benefits of it is it can help productivity. It can reduce a barrier for people to go in and uh, get some of their basic cancer screenings completed, blood pressure screening, uh, some of those things. But um, employer clinics at the work site can be really expensive. Um, and so there can be other ways to make sure people are getting cancer screenings and blood pressure screenings and, and managing their chronic conditions. Um, so So I always approach it as a conversation. It's a spectrum of of services that can be provided. It doesn't always have to be a bricks and mortar clinic that we we put up. Right. I'm going to have to have you back on just to talk on site clinics because uh, (laughs) it's a whole big conversation in itself, right? And it it ranges. And now there's telemedicine out there that's so popular. I'm coming into on site clinics with kind of an outsider's perspective and looking at it and saying, now, wait a minute, why would we want to do this? And um, and asking some of the, the questions that uh, can, you know, um, <laughs> rub people the wrong way sometimes, but I think they're the right questions that need to be asked. So. Well, I think they're questions that need to be asked, especially if an, if an employer is going to invest that much money into, mm-hmm. as you said, the brick and mortar, even if it's a small room you're putting a nurse practitioner in, it, it's, it's a lot mm-hmm. of money. And, you know, employers will spend money on certain things without questioning Really, wait, what is your investment worth? So I'm not going to say the ROI conversation, but what are you getting out of this investment? And, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've actually talked with a company that, uh, you know, said there's no way we can fund wellness. You know, I don't know. It's, it seems great. It's a great idea, but we just don't have the budget for it. Uh, and they had a $10,000 annual pizza budget. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, and I'm, you know, I love pizza. Let me just say <laughs> publicly, I'm going to say this I'm recorded. I love pizza, and it's nice when my employer gives me pizza. But you know, there are fresh ways that we can look at where to find the money. Uh, so yeah, I'm glad you bring that up. Oh, that's awesome. Sorry, I tried to move away <laughs> from the mi- microphone with my cackle laugh. I couldn't help it. Thanks for that. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll let that employer stay anonymous. They're, yeah. they're great people, but it was a fun conversation. <laughs> you just can't even say anything. You just would be like, I got nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Drop uh, the mic. Yes, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so one of my goals with this podcast, really the number one goal is, as much as kind of we poke fun at everything and decisions people make around wellness, I really do want to help employers implement a successful wellness program and be successful. Absolutely. You know, I mean, like I want them to engage employees. I want wellness to actually you know, help people change their health. So mm-hmm. what is one tangible tip an employer can take away from this podcast to use when implementing a wellness program? Stop thinking of it as a program. Oh, come on. <laughs> I can't, I can't get that. There. I, I cannot get program out of my nomenclature. It is, it is hardwired. <laughs> yeah, no, we do it too. But I think if we can have employers stop thinking of it as a program because that's a guaranteed way to struggle to get it funded, to have people lose interest after a couple of years and say, oh, yeah, that was a program we did a couple of years ago. Uh, because programs come and go. But to think about the fabric of the culture of their organization to think about like what, what is woven together to make them who they are. And that's a harder question to ask and, and a harder question to answer. And it takes time, but it's so worth the time. And so, you know, I think 
if you can go out as a business, go out and partner with businesses you admire. You don't have to admire them because of their wellness program. Admire who they are as a company and say, you know, like there's Zappos. That's a company I, I admire from afar and think it seems like a really cool company with a cool culture. I'm going to call them up. Like what makes you who you are? And then emulate some of that or figure out who makes you what you are as a company and start working on reweaving that fabric of who you are as a company. Um, but, yeah, if you keep thinking of it as a program, you're never going to sell it to the CFO. It's not going to get funded, and, and people will get bored with it, and it'll, it'll come and go. So have you read uh, Delivering Happiness by Tony I haven't. Shea? It's, it's no. Tony Shea who created Zappos, and it is an excellent book. Like it. All right. It's, it's amazing. It just it, He talks about it from startup and how they almost didn't make it a million times and how he really – understood that culture was what they were going to really make what was going to make them successful. So he started from the early stages of building that culture. And even I, uh, I was returning some shoes from Seth the other day and the, the customer service person was just funny. Like they, we were doing um, a chat and he just really, he or she um, had a uh-huh. great sense of humor. And I appreciated that because oftentimes, you know, people are reading a script and they're totally not engaged mm-hmm. in their job, but they let them have a little fun there. But I definitely recommend that, that book. It's, very good. It's oh, an easy read too. I guess there's a reason I was admiring Zappos because <laughs> that's something they've been they've been very thoughtful about. And I didn't realize that. So yeah, I'll definitely check it out. Any parting thoughts? Any words of wisdom? Anything you want to impart upon us? <laughs> you know, I think I just would encourage people, particularly in you know in our industry of worksite wellness, public health, and you know, kind of chipping away at this. Uh, that, you know, yes, it's hard. And I'm going to, you know, stand right there with you and say, this is really hard work. And sometimes I just want to sit on the corner with my guitar. Um, but, but if you speak your truth and insist that this must be part of how we do business, um, it's really worth it. And, and what I've found in the last three years, which is really awesome, is that if you're thinking that way, you're probably not alone. Um, you know, I discovered that there's this whole community. You know, Wellness Underground has grown in three years into this whole community made up of people who feel the same way I do. And, and so, um, yeah, speak your truth and be courageous. And I think we can, we can really shift the paradigm. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the redesigning wellness podcast. Visit redesigningwellness.com for free resources and more information on my consulting services and resilience training. Do you have a worksite wellness question you need answered? Shoot me an email at jen at redesigningwellness.com with your question. It may be answered on a future episode of this podcast. Thanks for listening.